Good morning, gentlemen and ladies. Today's session is on architecture requirement and design. So far, we have covered huge mileage by any standards. When this course was uh, taught about 10 years back, what you've learned so far would constitute the course for the midterm examination, not now. There have been a number of questions that have been put up in the last two sessions. I will not be addressing them today because you'll have two weeks after today to get your bearings about the course. You will get an opportunity to read the course handout. You will get an opportunity to look at the textbook and go through the pre-recorded lectures provided by one of my colleagues. So when you've done all that, many of those questions may not remain. There was one relevant question. Somebody asked, what is T1 with a lot of numbers written there? T1 means text one, and the numbers indicate the chapter numbers. So against various portions. So with that in mind, I'll just give you a quick view of the course handout. This is today's session, and which tells you that you should have seen recorded lectures 19.1, 19.2 before coming for the session. So this, this was session one, this is session two. Please note, so the structure of the course is defined here, and module one was covered in the first session, for which you should have seen these recorded lectures, and you should have read chapter one to three and chapter 24 of the textbook. Now, you must bear in mind that everything covered in the textbook is not covered in class. Everything covered in the textbook is not covered in the recorded lectures pre-recorded lectures. So all three put together constitute the course material. There is a good bit of duplication. And there is material which is covered separately as well. Take a look at module two. These are the chapters you're supposed to have read. And that's enormous, which means you covered almost half the textbook. And for today's session, you should be reading 15, 16, and 17. There's very little remaining after that, you'll notice. There's too much left to be done. But all in all, we have got nine modules. And the course handout is correct. It is not to be updated. It is final and is binding for the course. So let's not have questions about the course handbook. These are the textbooks that you expect you to have. And this is another text material which you're supposed to go through. This, this is reference material which is required for the course. Most of it will be required after the midterm examination. Now, this is the module structure of the course, the learning outcomes, and this is where I get involved, the contact session plan, and here's my name. There's a glossary explaining the meaning of various terms used, but you will notice there are some lab exercises and people have been very much concerned about the lab exercises. The beauty with the lab exercises is that they don't carry marks. You are expected to carry them out on your own, and Explanation of the lab exercise or the learning exercise has been given down here. This is what you're supposed to do. So do it with your friends, colleagues. It's a lot of self-study, looking up the internet. So these are the learning exercises or the lab exercises that you're supposed to take care of. So by now, you should have completed LE1 and LE2. The material you study here is very much a part of the course for the examination. 
Now, let's get back into our sessions. Session three, session four, session five, session six, and carries on like that. There are some case studies which you should be spending some time on. Where to get this material? I'll let you know as we go along. And here is the plan for the examinations and the quizzes. So we do not intend to have two assignments. We'll be having three quizzes and one assignment. This course will have both. Some courses have either assignment or quiz. In this, we'll be having both. Now, come here. This is how you expect to proceed with the course. Course plan. Module 1, Module 2, Module 3, the five sessions, contact sessions, and today we are the third contact session. And after the fifth contact session is a midterm examination. In reality, we might exceed the fifth session before the midterm examination, but the syllabus so the midterm examination is clearly stated, session one to five. Likewise, please note that the end semester examination syllabus is CS one to eleven, not six to eleven. So, the course plan there should be no ambiguity about. There have been tons of questions in the question answer in the uh, chat sessions. So I thought might as well clarify this course handout is correct. It is final, it is self-explanatory, you need to take a printout, go through it properly, and follow it. Okay, so this is what this course is about. With that, I will close this particular page. Okay. Up to the midterm examination, you require only the first textbook. We'll discuss the second textbook later. So for now, please uh, go ahead and purchase the first textbook. It is required by you. Uh, I think I've discussed the midterm syllabus, and uh, mind you, it is a little problematic if in the third session people ask asking questions in the chat forum without looking up the course handout. So, as I pointed out to you just now, the midterm syllabus is very clearly explained in the course handout. Yes, somebody says, please, can you tell again? It is session. I have to open up that page to tell you, so I would request you to take a look at it yourself. I have forgotten. There is no issue of lab access as far as this course is concerned. If you are discussing some other course, please go and discuss with the faculty of that particular course. Uh, in this course, you don't need any lab access to do the lab exercises. These are exercises that you do on your own PC by studying the internet. So if it is related to some other course, please uh, refer there. T1 and T2 are the two textbooks. And 1, 2, 3 mean the chapter numbers in the textbook. So you don't need to submit any exercise regarding the lab. Uh, your students of MTech and when uh, uh, you understand that at this level, you are studying because you feel like studying, because you feel you need to know about the subject. Surely there's nobody here who's uh, doing it because they've got to get some marks for an examination. Marks distribution, I will check up later, but I do know that uh, because I've closed the course handout now, it's not open in front of me, but uh, the course handout should definitely be having the correct uh, uh, marks distribution. If it is not, it will need to be corrected. But uh, I guess uh, there will be two quizzes of five marks each, and there will be an assignment of 10 marks, something like that. The quiz will be online. Uh, it will appear on the Sheila. The dates have been given, I guess, in the course handout. Please refer to the course handout. I don't remember the dates of the quiz. So if you look it up, it's somewhere in September I get the first quiz, and second quiz is probably in October. And um, 
disposes of probably of five marks each. You'll have an assignment of 10 marks, and uh, we will be indulging in the assignment only after the midterm examination, so don't worry about it. But uh, uh, I can understand that uh, professionals have limited time. Any suggestion on how to go through it? Well, uh, it all depends, Mr. Professional, whether you want to be Bill Gates or you just want to earn some pocket money. Uh, it's a well-founded fact that the most successful people have the least time. But it's also an established fact that if you want a job done, you go to a busy person. I'm very happy to note that you're very busy. We can expect uh, some good output from you. People are busy because they do work and uh, they will continue to do. Um, it's outside the preview of this course, but uh, definitely there's something called the 80-20 rule. 80-20 rule says that 80% of the knowledge you need to possess can be done in 20% of the time that you would require for 100% of the knowledge. And uh, which is the 20% no teacher is going to tell? You'll have to judge on your own. If you want me to help you prioritize if the idea is just to skim over the course and not come to know much, well, one hint could be just take a look at the slides that appear for the examination. You will get excellent parts. You will might even be the topper in the course, but I would not trust you if I want an architecture to be developed. So you, scoping is totally up to you. Uh, as far as an examination is concerned, there's very little to be done. But as far as becoming an architect is concerned, well, it's a tough fight. They get the best salary, so why should one expect them to work very hard? Nothing comes without some hard work. Okay, so I'm sorry, I should not be uh, advising senior professionals. Many of you, many of you would be in a position to advise me, but let's move to the course. So, architecture requirement and design. And before I get into architecture requirement and design, I feel very tempted to cover a slide which I had given for self-reading in session one. So I'm going to go through it. Context of software architecture. And I'm going to go through it. Now, there's so many contexts in which we look at architecture. There's a technical context, there's a project life cycle, the project manager is interested in going ahead with the project and seeing it through to completion. And I can tell you, if you've been in IT long enough, you never get enough time to complete the project the way you'd like to. There are targets, deadlines, and you've got to get it right, and the time is limited. There's a business context, irrespective of what you do, uh, develop. The businessman is interested in his money. He's interested in his profits. He's interested in selling his goods. And you give him a lot of jargon where you tell him about service-oriented architecture, cloud computing. Uh, you talk about mobility, analytics. And he listens to you and he says, okay, tell me, where do I make the money out of all this? So that's the business context. The professional context is the architect himself. As an architectural professional, he wants to deliver a software that is right. And how does he look at the architecture? You have stakeholders, the people who have an interest in the application and hence in the architecture. And you look at the influences on the architecture and, and how the architecture influences the environment. So, I think this is something important to go through before we try to establish where we come to know about architecture. Now, it's very nice in the beginning of a course to make you feel very important, make you feel that you're going to be big guys, but it's just not that. And by the time you successfully become an architect, you will be controlling what the IT industry is all about. 
you will be determining the future of the world. And if you think, and as an architect, you're going to be the center of the universe, well, it's not a small assumption. <clears throat> now, why are you going to be in the center of the world? The way you look today has been determined by software architects in the last 30 years. They decided that you would have computing, they decided that you would have laptops, they decided you would have mobile devices, they decided that you, have, you would have iOS, Android, Windows. They decided how the network should work. And then you decided, or you didn't decide, you were left with no choice, you lived in that world. Now, in this world of the architect, if you've been an architect for the last 30 years and determined how things happen, I can tell you how it was 30 years back. Nobody gave you any hints. There were no standard models to follow. So what happened was, they just simply went out there and you thought. And when your boss asked you, what are you doing for the last two days? And you tell him, I'm thinking. Okay, you're thinking. And at the end of a lot of thought process, you came out with ideas, and some of these ideas became revolutionary and they changed the world. While you're getting ideas, unfortunately, projects have to move on. A project has got a life cycle, six months, six years, one year, two years, could be one month. And the end of the life cycle of the project, the project has got to be completed. And since you're all software engineers working in an IT company, you all know that a standard unified process model would consist of inception, some engineering, construction, and then you go to transition. So when you are having the inception with a lot of analysis put in, and then you get into the engineering aspect and you start doing your design, you've got to start moving with the construction. And then once it's constructed, the transition, and by then, if you get some new brain waves, you've got to be able to plug in some of them, leave out some of the others. And right through, you've got to keep in mind that there's a businessman out there who is bankrolling your project. There's somebody who wants to use the project for a purpose. And as a professional, you bring in your experience and your knowledge and the tools available to you to get the work done. Now, as a professional, what are you trying to address? I've got a point. Technically, you look at quality attributes. And when you look at quality attributes, you're looking at availability, you're looking at performance, you're looking at modifiability, you're talking about interoperability, that means operating in various environments, you're looking at modifiability, testability, you're looking at security. And in all this, the environment is influenced in your organization. You're probably working in an IT company and you've got some practices that your company follows, and there's some practices that are followed by the industry, standard practices. And then you've got to be aware of today's technology environment. You've got to be aware that today people are trying to do things small on a mobile. They are trying to have a social aspect to every application. There has got to be analytics, there's got to be mobility. So you are using cloud for resources. So all these factors, they constitute the technical environment in which the architect works. The life cycle, you have waterfall, iterative, agile, model-driven development, various life cycles may be going on, and the architect has to fit into those life cycles. So, Just a second, I'll just be back.
Okay. So when you start an architecture, there's got to be a business case. Business case means why is this application we put up in the first place? What is it to achieve? And in doing that, you've got to understand what are the requirements and out of these requirements, which are architecturally significant. Then you select solutions to solve it, you write it down, communicate it, you evaluate it in consultation with the stakeholders, you, you can do a proof of concept, you can test out, or you can check up whether certain uh, solutions are workable or not. Uh, am I speaking? Yes, the answer is yes. You are not hearing me. Can anybody hear me? Somebody will respond. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. And then when you implement, you've got to do a reality check. Reality check means you've got to check up whether what you intended to achieve through your architecture is actually getting achieved or not. So this is the type of activity that you have to do. Now, there are situations in today's fast-moving world that sometimes your business purpose changes by the time you complete your project. Oh, that's unfortunate. So there are ways to tackle it, and an architect has got to be forward-looking. That is why you have extremely experienced people or very learned people. So uh, in today's context, it's often said that good learning can be a substitute to years of experience, and that's what you are going through. Now, an architect may certainly have some altruistic goals, some he may have some national objectives, he may think something is good for civilization, but he's got to bear in mind that there's somebody out there who decided that the application was to be developed. He influenced the quality attributes that were to be satisfied. He or she decided as to what they would like to achieve. It is not your achievement as an architect that is important. You've got to carry the stakeholders or the people who run the business with you. Now, when the stakeholder says that, you know, I want a very secure application, I'll give you one example. There was a client of ours who was talking about an application which was obviously very, very confidential, did not want the data to leak, did not want anybody to be able to see things. And we worked out a fantastic security structure to make sure that the application could be broken. When we discussed with them and we talked to them about the cost of security, somebody says the course handout topics don't match the topics in the textbook. Okay, you can get to me directly with the analysis. <laughs> And I will send me an email, let me know that uh, the course handout uh, gives this topic and the chapter gives uh, this particular topic and hence you feel that so the chapter should not be studied. So we'll, uh, we'll take a decision on that. I'll refer it to the course building committee and the course building committee will have to come back with a decision. Uh, it might take a bit of time, but until that happens, let us say your courses as for the course handout, the chapters that are given there are meant to be studied, and uh, the heading that is given continues to be there. But the chapters of the textbook, which have been stated in the course handout, will continue to be in the course for the midterm examination. So, whereas the mismatch is concerned, it would be a cosmetic thing. We will refer to the committee which oversees this course and get it attended. Okay. So, Okay, somebody wants me to check up which edition of the book has been prescribed. Okay, I, it's a bit of a problem for me trying to look up. 
Well, uh, the course handout I looked up, it says third edition, right? Somebody wanted me to know which edition it was. Thank you very much. Somebody has given the answer there itself. But let us not have these interjections. I would request you to look up the course handout on your own. It uh, disturbs the flow of the class. So, okay. Now, these business goals could reflect in terms of functional requirements. They could reflect in terms of non-functional requirements. And I was giving you that example of security. Eventually, a client tells us, this particular machine is going to be in a locked room, and I'm going to keep the keys in my pocket, and I'm not going to have an internet connection on this machine. So what are we talking about? So when you're in close touch with the stakeholders and you know what they're looking for, you find solutions without having to build castles where they were not necessary. There are some business goals which may have no influence on the architecture at all. Some of them may have influence on the functions. Some of them may not have influence on either the functional or the non-functional aspects. So it's for the architect to figure out which of these business goals have an impact on the architecture. Let's look at it this way. Here are the business goals. Business goals, some of them raise the requirement of quality attributes and hence they influence the architecture. And some of these business goals have a non-architectural influence. Now we come to the professional context. So we have understood the technical context and there was a question here who said, what is the difference between the technical context and the professional context? In the technical context, context we talked about the environment which included SMAC. SMAC stands for Social Mobility Analytics Club. This is a very popular term these days. If you're not catching on, let me type it out for you. S M A C. I've typed it up there. Next to professional context, I've talked about SMAC, and this is the technical context. So SMAC is today's technical context, and it includes all the hardware that's available, the various types of software solutions that are available in the market. All that is the technical context. Now we come to the professional context. You, as a software architect are doing your duty to produce an architecture. You need to have certain skills. Could not see. Do, do a shift control Y if you are not being able to see. If you cannot see what I've typed, just type shift control and Y on your machine. Are you able to see it now? Shift control Y. No. Okay. Let's see. Control shift Y. Oh yeah, now people are beginning to say yes. Yeah, it probably took some time to pull the data. CK. So SMAC is a very important technical context in today's world. And SMAC stands for social, mobile, analytics, cloud. So that's the technical context. So, okay, some people are on mobile device and they are not being able to refresh on a mobile device. I'm sorry, I don't know, did not know this aspect of the technology. Okay, doesn't matter. So I've read it out in any case. Smack is a technical context. Now, an architect, uh, architect as a technical person should have very good communication skills. He should have negotiation skills. Oh, strange. We thought it was a highly technical job where an engineer who has studied a lot of books will be able to do it. Yes, you need a lot of knowledge, but you've got to be able to train your stakeholders. You know, many a time stakeholders, is something like the child who says, I'm feeling hungry and Ma gives a number of options of food and the child is not interested in any of them. And then when the correct option comes, it's okay. And sometimes the child will need to be educated as to what is good for the child and prompted so that the child goes in for the food required. I'm not trying to say that clients are children, but very often the clients may not be fully aware. Sometimes if you tell them the cost of the expectation, they realize that they didn't require that material at all. Sometimes the cost does not justify the business gains. So an architect will have to negotiate 
very good communication skills, diplomatic sometimes, sometimes play a father figure, sometimes play an educated person, sometimes play a trainer. The whole idea is get across and negotiate a settlement. All architectural designs are negotiated settlements. They are not, uh, they don't come out of God's book which says God said do this and it was done. And some sort of a leadership the architect has got to provide. So an architect has to be up to date on knowledge. You cannot afford to have become an architect in 1990 and think of surviving today's world if you've not been studying. You've got to know exactly how a cloud achieves what it achieves, at what cost, and how does it enable certain things to happen. You've got to know the content of what analytics are all about. So if an architect is not up to date, he's in trouble, and that is the professional context of an architect. Stakeholders. We've discussed stakeholders earlier also. They, they are the developers. They are the maintainers, they are the users, they are the people who pay the money. All of these are stakeholders. You have a large number of stakeholders, and if you sit down with all of them, they pull you apart. So, you know, they catch your hand, and everyone pulls in a different direction. And if you are not careful, you will lose all your hair. So, that's the type of situation an architect falls into. And in this course, we will learn techniques as to how an architect will negotiate such situations. But that's what the stakeholders do to an architect. Well, stakeholders do talk, but you have to be a great listener. They tell you what they require, but you've got to understand what they require. They have got the interest, they've got the concerns. You've got to align the interests and returns to the business goals. Understand them in the context of the business goals. And interpreted and documented and establish the link of what the stakeholders are telling you to business goals and the cost of achieving those goals. Now, this is a diagram from your textbook. Somebody is looking for modifiability, somebody is looking for performance, security, reliability, usability. Somebody says the cost should be low. Somebody says the feature should be neat, it should be user-friendly. Some people, somebody might even be saying that well, there'd be so much of loss of employment. And this is our architect friend tearing his hair apart, trying to figure out how to handle everything. Now, architecture is influenced by industry environment. What happens in the industry? The business and social influences are there. The architecture is influenced by the environment in the organization in which the application will be implemented, but also the organization in which it will be developed. You get something developed by some old-fashioned engineers, they may not like to use the cloud. They say, oh, no, no, cloud is too insecure. Okay. They may be right, they may be wrong, I'm not here to discuss that, but there will be a total avoidance of cloud only because that's an unknown factor. Instead of using analytics for business ends, they will go at no end to discuss the ethics of analytics. Well, then I'm not denying the fact that there's an ethical aspect to analytics and we have had a lot of noise about it in the US Senate in the last one year. But the reality is that you've got to these are influences. So, business, technical, project, all these interests coming through stakeholders on the architect. The professional influence is his own, and with that, he influences the architecture, which in turn impacts the system. So, the system is a product of the architecture which is selected by the architect, influenced by the stakeholder and his own professional judgment. Stakeholder is a product of technology, the project parameters, and the business requirements. Now, there's a technical context on the impact of architectures. 
the stakeholders will be affected in the next system they'll start thinking differently because uh, they have undergone a lot of education with the architect the because the architecture exists and they've been explained as to what the architecture will do the stakeholders now know what to expect what type of money they'll have to spend what type of reliability what type of security they're going to get much in advance of the system coming so they don't end up getting something they are not prepared for. Sometimes the stakeholders may be willing to spend more because they understood now that by spending this money, this is what they get. Without the architecture, they are not understood. So once the architecture was explained and the gains of the architecture was explained, they were in a better position. Now, a very important factor is that the customer now understands that he's not getting something off the shelf. It's not an off the shelf product. There's a product which is now being tailored to his specific requirements and the customer and the stakeholders are made to understand that requirements are just for functionality. So very often, customers are not willing to pay because I've got nothing against ready-made products, but somebody says, well, Tally costs just 8,000, 10,000, 30,000, 40,000 rupees. Why not use Tally? Yes, good, use Tally. There are a number of people, I would suggest, use Tally. They've got a certain budget. Tally is a financial accounting system for those who are not aware. So it fits into the budget. And it so happens that by sheer coincidence or good planning on the part of Tally, it meets the standard quality requirements of a large population at a very reasonable cost. So they go in for it. Whereas somebody else is spending millions of dollars trying to develop a financial accounting software and there will be some people who will be wondering why not tally. Now those people have got to be explained and have got to understand the business context of the product that you are giving. What are you giving? Because let me assure you I have used tally. It, gives you most of the standard things that accountant could be looking for and from the book. Yet, I've been in the business for some time and we have provided financial accounting solutions and many of your IT companies have got financial and banking verticals, huge teams of thousands of people working on developing products to meet the requirements of a banking industry and of our Fortune 500 and beyond those companies. So why all that? It's for the quality attributes. It's not to get a trial balance, not to get a ledger book or a sub-ledger, not to get a day book printed. Okay, those are standard financial outputs. Functionals. Functionally, if after all that is done, you're probably still getting a trial balance, a balance sheet, a printed account, which is presented to the shareholders but there's an enormous amount of work that goes into doing business that quality attributes are about. And at this stage, you should realize why architecture becomes so very important in the life of an IT professional. So, architectures, they will influence the project context because now having the architecture in place, the entire project implementation plan will change allocation of manpower, what are the components, of work breakdown structures of your projects will be changed because the work will be determined by the architect, so naturally now the work breakdown structures will be based on the architecture. So the entire team structuring will now be mapped based on the architecture that has been selected. This is context, context sometimes under Goribian. Companies could revise their entire IT budget based on an understanding of the architecture. Things that did not appear affordable suddenly become more than affordable because of the realization of the quality attributes and the impact on business. Areas in which the company was going to spend money, the company would decide, no, it was not really required. It was not a proper understanding. It was just a spur of the moment decision. Somebody said it and we accepted it. More probably, the chief executive of the company or a senior executive 
had gone abroad and looked at a company which is in a totally unrelated business, was impressed with the features, just realizing that they have got no implication in our business. So the business context does depend a lot on the architecture. Professionally, professionally, the architect himself changes. Today, I am not who I was 30 years back. Well, I did not have a knowledge of all the technology that I have. Today, the technology didn't even exist. So how would I think of this? But because of an open mind, open eyes, you saw what was happening. You saw how things were being built. You saw the world around you and you yourself grew as an architect. So this is the way and the architect himself gets influenced as a professional. The technology stacks come under technical context. So all this in turn, the system and the architecture go back to influence the cycle is complete. So this is the cycle that you have to understand, these two arrows. So you have architecture, you have system. We move to this way through the architect, into the architecture, into the system. And from the system and from the architecture, the architecture even without the system starts influencing all these people because the architecture comes into existence long before the system becomes visible. So it is the, like the lightning, it precedes the thunder. So the thunder will come a little later, the lightning comes early. And the lightning prepares the stakeholders to receive the thunder because they know exactly what to expect. So summary is a summary, talk about technical project life, business and professional context. And with that, we will move on to today's session. Well, that was very much relevant here. It can be deliberately kept out there so that you could go through it. And today we'll go on to this. We'll take a, let's say a five to 10 minutes break where you can go and have the customary coffee and we'll be getting back to you soon.